Welcome brewers and beer lovers to Flying Wombat TV, uh, the channel where it's all about making fun and creative styles of beer with biotechnology and science involved. So today we're going to be going through another brew day where we're going to brew an Australian pale ale along with you guys, but this time we're actually going to release the recipe out to you so that if you want to try and have a crack at brewing our beer, our Australian pale ale, go for it by all means. And if you have any questions or want to know more about processes or more details about how we do particular things, please drop a comment to us in the comment section and we'll be happy to help you out. So uh, join us for the ride and brew on. Quick breakdown on the ingredients we're gonna be using today. For the grains, we're gonna be using 96% of our grain bill as regular two row pale ale malt. 4% of the grain bill will be medium crystal malt. And we're using glad filled grains. Uh, they're really great. It's up to you though what you have available. And we're gonna be using 10 kilos of that for a 50 liter batch uh, up there for whatever the freedom unit is. And um, you know, adjust accordingly if you're gonna make a smaller batch. 180 grams of, of our hops are gonna go into the Whirlpool for our flavor and aroma. And that's a mixture of Azakar, Galaxy and Eldorado. Just eight grams of Galaxy hops going in for our bittering at the start of the boil. So we don't want this to be too much of a bitter beer. We want it to be very approachable as a pale ale. Three Whirlflock tablets to help clarify our beer before it goes into the fermenter. And lastly, we're gonna be using Kabike yeast. So this is one that we've been culturing for a while. You don't have to do a yeast starter like this in a culture. You can just pour it out of the packet. If you don't have access to Kabike yeast, you could use uh, SO4 or USO5. They'll work just as well. Uh, quick side note, guys. So we just wanted to point out that we are using the 65 liter Brewzilla for our brew day today, but we just wanted to stress that you don't need to have one of these systems. So if you're, you know, mashing in in an esky and then transferring to a uh, to a pot to boil in, if you're just doing it all in a pot with a brew in a bag sort of thing, doesn't matter. Whatever you're doing, this recipe will still work just as well, uh, and you're going to end up with pretty much the same tasting beer. So. If you don't have the ability to whirlpool, that's also totally fine. You can just throw your hops in after dropping the temperature to around 75 degrees. Um, and if uh, you don't have the ability to sparge, we'll also add an adjustment for the recipe in there if you don't have that sparging capability. But it's totally fine. Don't stress. You can brew this on just about any system. Okay, so now we need to crush our grains. Uh, we've got our mill set to a one millimeter gap from memory. Uh, we'll put that into inches, you know, over there somewhere if you're brewing in the States. So that's uh, a good crush size for us and for our system. Again, might vary on your systems. And if you don't have the ability to crush your own grains at home, your local homebrew shop can crush them for you. Or if you do an order online, you can order them pre-crushed. That's uh, totally up to you. So let's get to grain milling. <laughs> Give it a lick, mate. Stick your tongue in. <laughs> so when it comes to actually crushing your grains, you're looking for about a one millimeter gap in your rollers when you're crushing. If you're trying to do finer than that, you're going to end up with a more powdery grain crush. And that's kind of fine if you're not doing sparging, but it means you're going to have a little bit of a porridgey mess and it's going to be really hard to get your grains out of the liquid. If you're crushing much uh, higher than that with a bigger gap more coarsely, you're just going to lose a lot of efficiency. So one millimeter is kind of a good middle ground uh, for when you're actually crushing your grains. So what you're really aiming for is basically something that's going to look, you know, sort of like this. So if you can see that, so all of the uh, husks have been ripped up, all the grains have been crushed nicely, but it's not so fine that it's like a powder, but it's also not crushed so coarsely that the grain is almost unbroken. You're looking for something in that good middle ground there. Oh, all right. Good. Yeah. Fine, I look good now? Yeah, you I'm look pretty. Hot. All right. We don't have a wardrobe department yet. Yeah, where's our, yeah. Where's our makeup artist as well? <laughs> I don't think I'm so beautiful. Yeah. So, okay. All right, so mashing in, we've set our strike water temperature to 70 degrees, which is four degrees above what we're going to mash in at. We're going to mash at 66 degrees. So that's going to give us a fairly dry beer, but it's still going to leave enough unfermentable sugars in there that um, you know, give us a good bit of a mouthfeel, a good body. But you're setting it a couple degrees above what you actually want to mash at because when you pour those grains in, it's just going to cool the water down a bit. So set it at about 70 degrees for a 66 degree mash, you should be fine. What's that? So this is the uh, recirculating sparge arm. Uh, you don't need this, we happen to have one. So it just means that as, the, uh, as, the, as we're mashing, we can recirculate the wort through um, the grains. So it helps with our efficiency and just keeping the temperature even through everything. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so mashing in now, put, dump all of your grains into your, um, your mash tun and give it a big old stir with a mixing paddle. If you don't have a mixing paddle, you could use just a big spoon, a, um, a spatula, a whisk, you know, whatever you've got available. Basically anything to prevent dough balls from occurring and uh, which is basically when, you know, the outside of a whole clump of, um, you know, grains gets wet, the inside stays dry, just losing efficiency. So anything to just give it a good old mix up to uh, make sure that all the grains are just evenly, you know, wet and submerged. Alrighty, this is the satisfying part. No, 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 no. Something else that helps when you're mashing in is to do a little bit of grain at a time, then give it a mix, a little bit more grain, give it a mix, so on and so forth. Uh, it just makes it easy to mix everything through and you know prevents the dough balls from happening. All right, so we've got a dough ball here just to show you what it looks like. All wet on the outside, we break it open, it's all completely dry. So yeah, that's what you want to prevent from happening and that's why you give it a big old mix when you're mashing in. So now we're just putting our um, you know top filter on. Again, not every brewing system is going to have this. Ours does. Just lets us, uh, you know, recirculate the mash, uh, and at the end makes it easier for sparging. Um, if you don't have one of these, don't stress. It's really not necessary. But if you do, you know, whack it on. So now we're going to mash in for an hour, and then we'll come back at the end of that for the next step. All right. So now it's been 60 minutes. We've finished our mashing phase of the brew day. So we're going to pull our malt pipe up so that we can start sparging through. You don't have to do this if you don't have the ability to sparge. If you do, uh, join us for the next step. So what has the mashing stage done? So now we've extracted all of the sugar, all the fermented sugars out of our grains. And uh, now we're going to raise this up so you can see the, the clarity of this now. And that's the benefit of being able to recirculate your work. You get really, really clear work. So. Uh, the mashing has basically just gotten all of the sugar out of the liquid, out of the uh, out of the grain. So now we've got a nice big thing of sugar water. <laughs> what did you do? <laughs> I was out of the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was wondering why that felt weird. <laughs> Ready? Heave ho! Nice and easy. No more. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're setting up our sparge. So this is our hot liquor tank here. So this is at 78 degrees, which is what I'd recommend you set it to if you're gonna be doing a sparge as well. And you're literally now just gonna run that hot water over your grain bread to uh, get any uh, extra sugars that are still stuck inside these grains out into your wort. That's literally all it is. Just getting a little bit of extra efficiency and a bit more beer for your buck. So we've now finished our sparging. All the liquid from the hot liquor tun has now gone into the boiler. Uh, now we just got to let the remaining liquid drain through, ramp this thing up to boiling temperature. Then we can start adding our hops and getting to the fun stuff. Quick little update for you. We have added an extender tube onto our boiler. So you can get these from Kegland if you're using a similar system. We'll put another link in the comment section below. Uh, but yeah, this is basically just because if you have a look in here, our liquid is getting right up to the top of the boiler's original total volume. So just to prevent a boil over and a giant mess from happening, we just put the extender on to give ourselves a little bit of extra wiggle room. All right, so now we're at boiling. We're ready to add our bittering hops. Again, this is just the eight grams of uh, Galaxy. So just gonna give us a decent amount of bitterness without blowing our socks off. So. Throw it in. You don't need a hop spider. We have one just helps to filter out, you know, the hop debris. If you don't have one, you can just throw it straight into the boil. It doesn't really matter too much. Now we'll come back uh, at 45 minutes where we're gonna add our World Hop tablets. So now we're adding our World Hop tablets. So if you don't know what they are, they're basically an extract from red seaweed, which has a bunch of different enzymes and compounds in it that help to coagulate all the hazy and uh, clumpy proteins inside a mash. So we throw them in now, they'll be in the boil for 15 minutes and that's gonna help us give us a clearer beer. All right, so at the end of the hour now, so the boil is done and we're ready to start cooling our wort down. So for this, you would use a, uh, a chiller coil like we have, you could use a plate chiller. Uh, if you don't have any kind of cooling system, you could just turn the power off and dunk your pot or whatever it is you're using, maybe a bigger bucket of water or an ice bucket or something. Or you could just let it cool down naturally. That is an option as well. It's not entirely necessary to cool it down this fast. 
If you have the capability to do this, it is useful though. So basically we're just gonna cool this down to 75 degrees. Then we're gonna start our whirlpool and we're gonna throw in all of our flavor and aroma hops. So we've now cooled our uh, boiler down to 75 degrees. If you have the capability to whirlpool, like a pump or something to recirculate it, you know, you should be whirlpooling it now. Uh, if you don't have a pump or something, you could also use a drill, like uh, with like a, um, a paint mixer on the end, give it a good stir, get a whirlpool going, or just use a big spoon, start spitting it, get a whirlpool. Anything like that is just so that when you throw in your hops, you're just gonna get maximum extraction out of it and um, and help clarify the beer as well. So we're now in the whirlpool stage, all of our flavor and aroma hops are in. You can now let this sit for 20 minutes and then we'll start cooling this down to yeast pitching temperature. The reason we throw our hops in at whirlpooling instead of adding it like 10 minutes at the end of boil, 15 minutes end of boil, something like that, is because whirlpooling gives you much better extraction of the hop oils and it doesn't cause the uh, hops to actually isomerize, the alpha acids ins inside the hops to isomerize, which is where you get that bittering flavor from. So by adding it in the whirlpool stage, we get maximum oil extraction out of the hops without any of the bitterness. Okay, so it's now been 20 minutes, so we're gonna start uh, cooling down all of this. So just activate the, the water coming through your chiller, through your chiller plate, or you know if you're putting your, uh, you know, your pot into a big bucket of water, whatever it may be, start cooling down your wort now to pitching temperature. So we're using kvike yeast, so we're gonna only cool this down to 35 degrees because that's the temperature that kvike yeast loves. For a regular yeast like a SO4 or a USO5, you probably wanna cool this down to about 18 degrees. So that's the end of our brew day now. So I'm gonna transfer all of our wort into the fermenter. So if you're using Kvike yeast, you wanna pitch the yeast at 35 degrees. Using any other you know, English or American style yeast, you probably wanna pitch it at about 19, 18 degrees. Uh, so the fermenter that we're using is an SS Brewtech um, half barrel fermenter. So this thing holds up to 62 liters-ish from memory. Uh, and we'll do a full debrief on what this fermenter is at some point. It's a whole bunch of complex stainless steel and bits and bobs. But for now, it doesn't really matter. If whatever fermenter you have, just transfer all of your wort into the fermenter and then pitch your yeast. So with that, start the pump. Start transferring. There it is, that golden goodness. So now this thing is all in the tank, all of our wort's in the tank. It's cooled down to pitching temperature. Grab your yeast, whether you're using a yeast culture like this or if you're using uh, fresh packets, it's time to dump them in. So tip it all into the tank um, and then let these good guys just start doing their thing. So now the next time we're gonna be touching this tank is when we dry hop it. So you don't have to dry hop if you don't want to. I would recommend it. It's gonna give you that extra boost in hop flavor and aroma. Uh, not strictly necessary, but uh, you know, if you want to, it's there. It's going to be in the recipe. So you'll dry hop when your gravity reading gets to about 1.014. That's when you've got a couple points left before fermentation finishes. So that's when you want to throw your dry hops in. That'll prevent hop creep. We'll do another video on that later. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's the best time to dry hop right before fermentation finishes. Just give you that big boost in hop flavor and aroma. So now it's been a week and a half. So we want to add our dry hops into this uh, pale ale. So take a gravity reading. When your gravity hits about 1.014, that's when you want to throw your dry hops in. We're gonna finish with more or less a final gravity of about 1.01. So when you get to those last couple points, that's when you're gonna throw in your dry hops. I'm not gonna tell you exactly what day to do it because depending on what yeast you use and how, uh, what temperature you manage to keep your tank at, it might take longer for you, might be a little bit quicker. For us, it's at day 10. So at 1.014, we're gonna add our dry hops and we're gonna be adding in 60 grams each of Azacar, Eldorado and Galaxy into the tank. So we have a pretty complex looking fermenter here with a whole bunch of bits and bobs hanging off it. What we've got at the top here is a thing that lets us do zero oxygen dry hopping. So you don't need this. If you have one, great. Most people aren't gonna have one of these, totally fine as well. Just open up your fermenter, dump your hops in and close that fermenter up as fast as possible so that you prevent as much oxygen getting in as you can. So we're gonna open this bad boy up. We're gonna dump our hops in. Then we're gonna purge this thing here with carbon dioxide. And then we're gonna uh, dump them into the tank. There, get in there, hoppies. Nice. I love dry hopping, it's so satisfying. All right. 
Now we're gonna connect the CO2, we're gonna purge this, and then we're gonna let these hops drop into the tank. Just give it a second, let the carbon dioxide get in there. One more time should be good. Alrighty. And now we just open this uh, butterfly valve here and we're gonna dump all of this good stuff into the tank. Hops away! There you go, nice. nice. All right, thanks for sticking with us guys and uh, joining us for this brew day. So, um, you know, as I said before, we're gonna release this recipe along with this video. So you're gonna be able to find it down below and there's gonna be step-by-steps, exact ratios of everything. So you can actually go and do this yourselves at home. And uh, in a couple weeks, uh, once we, after we've released this video, we're gonna do a tasting video so we can actually go through how this beer turned out and give you guys our honest opinions on it. And if you guys, you know, taste the beer after making this yourself, let us know what you think as well and what you think we could change and improve for the next one. Uh, so if I haven't said it already, give us a like, throw us a subscribe, and you know, as always, happy brewing. So just, it's working. First stage of brewing. <laughs> <laughs> it's turned on this time.